for those um, who are not Poker Code members already, you should know that my coachings usually are a little, little different because I usually don't start with talking about poker, but have some weird examples that only in the end make sense. And I found one for today as well. We are still talking about poker today, but this won't be the start. Yeah, make poker simple again. This is what we are talking about today. What does it actually mean? What do I mean with making poker simple? And why do I say actually again? Is poker tough these days? Is it tough to learn? Is it not? We'll talk about my opinion on preflop, about charts, when they make sense, when not. How should we treat them? When should we use them? When don't they make any sense? The next thing, um, we'll talk about postflop. We'll talk about simplification. Simplification is the absolute key in my very personal opinion. Plenty of examples, different spots to really showcase what I mean with that, how you can put that into work, how it can help your poker game. Yeah, let's start with one thing. We start with what does it mean? And you can give it a guess. I gave you like two teams. We see on the left side, actually the starting 11 of Real Madrid's uh, Champions League final this year. I don't think personally they were the best club. I still went for the winner to just not be biased and present them in the way as like they were the best club last year, maybe even in Champions League. And on the right side, you see the starting 11 of the last um, match versus Niederbühl Donau from my hometown team, FC Gansbach. Yeah, give it a little guess. How can that relate to poker? What is the difference between those teams? Like really name it, try to name it, even if it seems like the most stupid question of all times and try to, to give it a guess. High stakes versus micros, individual skill, experience, time invested. Very good stuff. One team has better players on every single position. We are talking about position, right? Interesting. Better coaching, better preparation. You nailed it. I, you don't need the next slide. I still put it in here. We are talking about the second lowest league in Germany. They finished just 13th in the table with like 16 clubs in there, they made 29 goals and they conceded 98. Bad rail versus good rail. The rail might be a little better actually at the FC Gansbach than at Madrid. But um, yeah, this is just a personal opinion. Gansbach in this case is every one of us. We are learning and we are far away from being good. And Real Madrid in this case here will be the solvers we are looking at. The solvers and the machines and like everything, they are just way stronger actually these days than the strongest humans. But what we are doing is, and what actually lots of low level clubs do as well, they try to copy something from the top level. But we try to copy the perfect solver. We try to copy the system of Real Madrid, but this depends on the players as well, right? Who is playing their midfield? Toni Kroos, Luka Modric, Casemiro. They are just like not losing a single ball. Like on the right side, I can give you some insights, right? This Marco Merkel guy, like he has the worst right foot you have ever seen and he's right footed. So this guy is running a marathon. That's great, right? He's running nonstop. Andy, yeah, usually playing like actually the second team. He's more like drinking the wheat beer, beer afterwards, like not really into it. The right team actually doesn't even have a striker because this guy turned 36 and finally retired. Like copying, that doesn't make any sense. Why not take the strength of like those individual players, if there are any, or just choose a system to cover the weaknesses maybe as well. This is now where I see how it relates to poker, because if you think about how are most people studying these days, they are trying to copy the very, 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 very best, which is the solver actually right now. This might be fine, but it's actually like not achievable to play correctly after that. You just totally mess up. The first thing we need to do is accepting this, accepting that we are shit compared to the solve, maybe even compared to the best players, some more or some less. It's like the question, okay, how can we build things that we actually as like being humans execute that as good as possible? What is our personal system? How can we still be successful? How can we actually be better than others? Right, so this is what I mean with that. I talked about it already a lot, understanding what a solver shows us. The solver actually shows us the EV of every single hand and of every action that we take if we play perfectly like the solver on every future street and if Villain plays perfectly on every future street versus your exact strategy as well. As I said, we are sitting all together in this one boat. We are all shit together compared to the solver, not compared to the other players. We can easily beat them if we make great game selection, if we are just 12 better than, than them, that helps obviously. But compared to the solver, we are all shit. We are messing up all the time and we need to be aware of that. The more complicated we make things, the more we will mess up later. And at the same time, we know that villain will mess up as well. The full focus should actually be on us, right? How can we build a game tree that makes sense 
that we can actually execute. Instead of saying, let's, I've seen Real Madrid play and now I try to play the same like them. This is what I mean with, it got kind of complex. We can see all that, but it's just 100% not realistic that we execute that. Cool, let's start with preflop. Preflop for me means really here, there is lots of decisions to take on further streets. We talked about we need to play perfectly on all streets. Since we are preflop, there are still lots of streets to come. Lots of room for messing up. Actually, I think there are not many people using three different open race sizes, and this is for a reason. Even the sims you are running for preflop solutions, you are not like playing around with like four sizings. If we go a little deeper there, in the poker world, in the poker solver world, this would be a thing, definitely. Why should we bet like raise every hand 2.5x or so? So now I could show you all charts in this world and it will show like this is a mix, it's zero EV. And people talk about that, this is hand is zero EV, but this hand is nothing. If you're better than villain and he messes up more, every hand gets easily plus EV in the first place. This obviously means the weaker you are, the tighter your ranges should be, the better you are, the loser your ranges should be, right? I'm messing up here a little, so don't get confused. So the weaker you are, the tighter ranges you should start with. Probably the hands that are shown in a solver world as like, it's okay to open raise that, you make like one cent or something. Maybe just leave that, give up on that EV because it makes your game tree way easier, right? Just maybe start under the gun with sixes plus. Why not suited connectors and go with ace, jack plus, king, queen plus. Like, or it makes it way easier to not mess up later. Be aware of what you're doing. Yeah, this is, my take on charts, just really focusing on those two points that the solver is not thinking about. Doesn't need to think because the solver is always playing perfect and the villain solver is playing perfectly as well. Let's go to post flop. So this was my take on charts. Now we get to post flop where you see already we are a little closer directional and a little less decisions left. Preflop is over. We make a post flop decision. We only need to play turn and river perfectly or we mess it up there. Here, I want to do the same thing. I focus on playing as good as possible, which is like kind of the thing like that's not easy to do, but to take care of, to think about how can I play better there? And I want to focus on villain play, uh, playing as poorly as possible, playing more hands against weak players. But I cannot design a game tree in a way, maybe we can actually, but it's tougher to say like, okay, he's messing up more there because we cannot just know. Like maybe we know some leaks. If someone is just very, very passive and tight, maybe I want to do lots of bets with lots of small sizes, give them chances to fold. Maybe if someone is super like just clicking the call button, maybe want to use huge sizings, which actually force him to fold a lot. Something like that is obviously possible, but it's always best to always look at yourself first. The key to that, in my opinion here, how do we achieve that is always simplification. And the goal is just that we build our personal game tree. We always want to simplify without giving up too much solver EV, I call it. It has nothing to do, to do with real EV because, well, we are messing up, villain is messing up. I will repeat that another 10 times this session. I don't try to give up too much of that because whenever I do that, it means, well, if villain is playing perfectly now, I'm giving up EV. Main goal here really is that we beat our villains by playing future streets better than them. We want to prepare us to not mess up. So simplification guidelines. Always look at those big mix strategies with keeping a focus on is there a hand that clearly wants to use one certain sizing. If you find a hand that is not mixed, that says I want to bet huge, that usually means that there is EV coming from. If there is a hand that wants to bet small 50% and check 50%, it just means I don't give a shit, it's the same. It doesn't mean we need to mix, it means do whatever you want. Feel free to build your game tree. If you do this or that, it's same EV. Then maybe one thing as well to understand is that small sizings actually make villain's life tougher. Simplifications lead to betting often small, range betting, for example. And this actually makes villain's life tougher. If I use a huge bet, Villain can just throw away, let's say, 50% of his range. And trust me, folding is easy when you don't have anything. If the solver would fold and Villain folds, he played perfectly with 50% of his hands, which is not great. If you see that small and you force Villain to defend very, very wide and add like lots of check raises, he needs to play like an aggressive style with lots of bullshit hands, which is definitely tougher. So actually it can happen that we make our life easier while making it tougher for vill Villain. And then the earlier the street, the more it's just a preparation for the next street, the more we should simplify because it is our goal to prepare for the next street and play that then perfectly. Let's get to our first example. 
and we'll start with a very easy board that is actually 987 Rainbow. For the example to have wide ranges to be freaking crazy, we take. I hope it's big enough for you. If not, I'll talk everything through anyways. There's 987 multiple sizings. We take a look first and I show you how I work here. If you open up GTO Wizard or Odin or everything, this is a great tool. They like those sims run forever. I ran some scripts tonight. So it was fine, but it's still not the highest accuracy. I don't care here, but they, they take forever. So it's great when you have something like that, but now it's important to look at them in the right way. So here I actually only offered three sizings, quarter pot, half pot, and pot. And now I wanna look at it with those eyes, what is actually necessary, right? This is the game tree here. Uh, we see, okay, half pot sizing is very nice. Maybe we could add like 75 as well, or 40 or 35 and 25 is like, somewhat there and now I want to look at the individual combinations and figure out what hands are actually clearly doing one thing. We figure out that pocket tens we should not check, right? So this is a learning. Maybe jack 10 we should not really check that often either. And pocket fives are a pretty clear check as is like the ace five of no backdoor, right? So something like that we can see from that and now I want to take that and actually simplify that we see, I'm looking at this EV here. This is the EV for in position. This is like for like typical two five stack size. So this is like one big blind is, is $5 here. So, and there's like 5.5 big blinds in the middle. So you can have like a rough estimation what that is in, in big blinds. I should have taken other numbers, but this is just my, my preset stuff. I obviously just took the half pot as an option. This is a strategy that I think is way easier to execute. And if we look at the EV, we actually see, okay, it's not very accurate already because the right sim actually has a higher EV. But obviously the left sim could ex play exactly like that. And if we keep that running forever, the left side needs to be higher or at least exactly the same, the same EV. Like this is not possible, but this is how the solver works if it didn't run forever. But this is enough for me to say like, first simplification, I'm not using three sizings. I'm actually betting half pot or check. Maybe I can run it now and say like maybe 60% is a little better or 40%, but trust me, once you've done that a couple of times, you see it's always the same and it just doesn't matter. Big learning there, okay. We have an easy game tree now. And maybe what I wanted to do next is pull out paint and just show you maybe a little visually what we did. Here, villain check to us and we are on the flop and I'll just draw the game tree. We have multiple options on the left side. We had the option to bet pot. We had the option to bet half pot. We had had the option to bet quarter and we had the option to check. And now obviously let's say villain is mainly answering by calling. If he folds, we don't care, hand is over. And once he's raising, he is deciding everything and we can only react. So once we do that like this, it's obviously like four different game trees. And this is what I mean for the turn play. On the turn, maybe we have multiple sizings as well and we need to think about, okay, what happened before. It's like a turn play after betting big, turn play after betting half pot, turn play after betting quarter pot. And you see already like once, like there's not even space. If there's no space in paint for the river, there is no space in our brain either. Let's have a look at the right game tree. We can bet half pot or we can check. And then we go from there and maybe on the turn, let's see, we simplify and only have like one size here as well, size or check. You see, there's still room for the river play and this is a, a game tree we can execute. This is what FC Gensbach can work with and maybe try to have like a plan. This was actually what I ran overnight. So we have one, two, three, four, five sizings on the flop plus the check. I didn't offer too many race sizes, but this usually doesn't change much. We offer five different sizings and the check. Yes, take your players from Real Madrid and work with them on that. I think that's okay. I think they should maybe simplify to three sizings, but actually we found a board where, I mean, probably accuracy is not the highest, but it's it's decent already. Where actually all freaking five sizes are actually used. How many turn sizes do you prefer in general? I'm never using more than two for a board. I'm not having like two sizings fit all boards, but every individual board, I'm using maximum two sizings. Preferably just one. So now I want to show you something again, a little look into my brain, how I want things to work. I know that there are lots of people working like this little organization diagram on, on the left. I call that the solver nerd business organization, which works in that way that this guy might be discussing. This is what the arrows is like, like having information flowing from like one side to the other and the other, uh, other way around. 
Um, and they are discussing, but they are just.